Hi, this is Mrs. Chavez. We're starting um, chapter 33. We're starting actually World War One, and we're going to be looking at this um, chapter, the world in upheaval. And um, this first, I broke it down into two sections. The first section will be basically the catalyst of the war and the reasons for the war, building up to the war. The section two is going to be about the war itself, what took place during the war. So. The catalyst for the war of 1914 to 1980 was 18 was the assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand. He was heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. Well, the underlying causes were many, including intense nationalism, frustrated national ambitions, ethnic resentments, and the pursuit of exclusive economic interest, abrasive colonial rivalries, and a general struggle over the balance of power in Europe and in the world at large too. So as not to find themselves alone in a hostile world, national leaders sought alignments with other powers, the establishment and maintenance in Europe of two hostile alliances, the Allies, which were the Triple Entente, and the Central Powers, the Triple Alliance, helped spread the war from the Balkans to the rest of Europe and eventually to, to the rest of the world. So let's take a look at some of the immediate origins and causes of the um, World War One. First of all, Serbia had been a threat and an irritant to Austria-Hungary, particularly since it won the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, and as a consequence had nearly doubled its territory and increased its population from 3 to 4.5 million. The government's aim was to unite even more Serbian territory and people with Serbia, and those people happened to live in the multi-ethnic Austria-Hungary, including Bosnia, which had been annexed by Austria-Hungary in 1908. Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was a great friend of Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany and met with him in mid-June in 1914 to discuss the tense situation in the Balkans. Two weeks later, on June 28, Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie were in Sarajevo to inspect the Imperial Armed Forces in Bosnia-Herzegovina when 19-year-old Gavrilo Princip and his fellow members of the Nationalist Young Bosnia Movement um, learned of the Archduke's planned visit, so they took action. So supplied with weapons by a Serbian terrorist organization called the Black Hand, Princip and his um, cohorts traveled to Sarajevo in time for the Archduke's visit. The royal couple was touring the city in an open car with surprisingly little security, and one of the nationalists threw a bomb at the car, but it rolled off the back of the vehicle, wounding um, an army officer and some bystanders. Later that day, the Imperial car took a wrong turn near where Princip happened to be standing. He was actually sitting in a cafe drinking coffee. Seeing his chance, Princip fired into the car, shooting Franz Ferdinand and Sophie at point-blank range. He then turned the gun on himself, but was tackled by a mob of bystanders who restrained him until the police arrived. The Archduke and his wife were rushed away to seek medical attention, but both died within the hour. And his wife was also um, three months pregnant at the time. If you think about this, the outcome of one bullet, the Princip bullet into the Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie caused the first global conflict of huge proportions. There was a conservative estimate of 15 million dead and 20 million injured in this war. It ended four empires and there actually grew out of it nine new countries. It was caused massive global um, dislocation and it really ended Europe's domination of the world. So let's take a look at some of the larger global causes of World War I. In order to maintain its credibility as a force in the Balkan region, let alone its status as a great power, Austria-Hungary needed to enforce its authority in the face of such insolent crime. Um, however, with the threat of Russia, um, the Russian intervention looming and its army unprepared for a large-scale war, it required Germany to help back up its words with force. Emperor Franz Joseph wrote a personal letter to Kaiser Wilhelm requesting his support, and on July 6, German Chancellor Theobald Bethmann Hallweg informed Austrian representatives that Vienna had Germany's full support. 
So as a result of the French Revolution, we had Napoleon who uh, was going around conquering parts of Europe and basically making enemies for the French people. So the outcome of the French Revolution was one thing, um, the self-determination and independence movements. In Belgium, there was, a, in 1830, then there was the unification of Italy, and then the unification of Germany in 1871. Nationalism, plays, nationalism played a huge part in the events leading up to the war. On July 23rd, the Austro-Hungarian ambassador to Serbia delivered an ultimatum. The Serbian government has to take steps to wipe out the terrorist organization at Black Hand within its borders and suppress anti-Austrian propaganda and accept an independent investigation by the Austro-Hungarian government into Franz Ferdinand and his wife's assassination or face military action. So after Serbia appealed to Russia for help, the Tsar's government began moving towards mobilization of its army, believing that Germany was using the crisis as an excuse to launch a preventive war in the Balkans. Austria-Hungary declared war in Serbia on July 28th, August 1st, after hearing news of Russia's general mobilization on the border. Germany declared war on Russia. The German army then launched its attack on Russia's ally France, going through Belgium, violating Belgian neutrality, which had been the um, Peace of London, uh, the treaty, and um, bringing Great Britain into the war as well. National rivalries also played into this. Um, in 1870, 32% of the world's industrial output was um, in, from Great Britain, and Germany only comprised 13% of it. In England, it drops to Great Britain drops to 14% by 1914. There also was imperial competition. Their competition over the colonies in Africa and in Asia. Germany was a very latecomer, but they were very, very aggressive. And then, of course, those disputes that were around the globe, especially in the Balkans, um, because of nationalism. Also, there was an arms race that was taking place in Europe at the time. The naval race between Germany and Great Britain um, started around 1906. Of course, it culminated in 1914 and created a huge friction between both nations. And it was seen as really one of the causes of World War I. In 1906, Britain launched its first dreadnought. That's a ship that meant all others were um, redundant before its awesome firepower. Militarism um, also caused the war due to the naval and arms race. The main event of militarism causing World War I was that naval rivalry, which was made after the 1900s. While Britain and Germany built up their navies, the major powers on mainland Europe were also building up their armies. Public opinion played a huge role in World War I. When the war came to Europe, it came during harvest time, and most ordinary people heard the news as they worked in the fields. And they reacted not with great enthusiasm, but with shock and fear. Other people, especially the intellectual and, and the city dwellers, met the news with euphoria. Many of them had long expected war and saw it as a liberating release of pressure that would resolve these conflicts, um, political, social, and economic crisis that had been building for years in Europe. When the first contingents of soldiers left for the front, jubilant crowds threw flowers at the feet of the party men who expected to return victorious after a short time. Reality crushed any expectations of a short and triumphant war. Even in democratic societies at the time, governments then assumed dictatorial control to marshal the human and material resources required for the war. And it may surprise you to learn that some sectors of the European public were in favor of the war in 1914. The impact of the modern weapons was not well understood, and many people in the government, military and civilian populations both, imagined that the conflict would be short. One simple explanation, of course, was that practically no one from the ordinary citizen to the heads of government and military generals imagined or could begin to imagine the reality of the war that would unfold. There was little awareness of the terrible effects of these modern weapons or the fact that they would result in a long war. Although books, articles, and newspapers did refer to the negative impact of a, the conflict might have. That short war illusion was in part a consequence of the lessons being drawn from history. The most recent war between major European powers, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, which remained relatively in fresh memory for the populations of 1914, had only lasted from July 19, 1870 to January 29, 1871, about six months. 
And we come to another um, reason why this war started, and that was understanding um, these alliances, all these alliances that were taking place at the time. In the late 19th century, the most powerful European countries maneuvered to create alliances. No single con country dominated Europe at this time. Instead, several great powers, such as Russia, France, Germany, Great Britain, and Austria-Hungary, all vied for the upper hand by making alliances with or against each other. Military defensive uh, pacts and agreements leaders thought might be the balance of the power in their favor. Furthermore, alliances they believed would create peace through strength because an attack on one country would result in a massive response from its allies. This threat, the theory went, would be deter attacks. And this way, the partnerships in Europe created a tense balance of power, like two equally strong sports teams facing off against each other. But the alliances might also transform a small crisis into a massive war by triggering a domino effect of countries promising to defend each other. Just before World War I, the great powers of Europe split into those two main teams, the Triple Alliance, Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Italy, and the Triple Entente, Britain, France, and Russia. The Triple Alliance, known as the Central Powers during the war, centered on a coalition in Central Europe of the biggest states with German-speaking rulers, Germany and Austria-Hungary. When Prussia defeated Austria-Hungary in, in the war in 1865, the new um, Prussian state gained much respect from the old Habsburg monarchy in Vienna, Austria. Leaders from both countries saw the mutual benefit of aligning the two contiguous German-dominated countries. Italy also joined in hopes of taking territory from France. In 1882, the three states agreed to a defensive alliance in which members promised to support each other militarily if they were attacked. As a result, the Triple Alliance created an uninterrupted wall from the northern to the southern tip of Central Europe, from Germany to Austria-Hungary to Italy. When World War I began, Italy decided to break the alliance, but Turkey joined the new, newly named Central Powers. So what were the concerns of the Entente? Well, before Russia entered the agreement with the other two countries of the Entente, it was necess it's necessary to note that France and Russia had been opponents during the Crimean War. Right? That was in 1853 to 1856. However, also, Russia sought reassurance against the Germans who were attracted by the idea of expanding towards the east. Um, yet Russia was not only seeking to defend itself from the potential conflicts, it also had to deal with um, major interior struggles. In fact, it was the most backward of the European powers and was struggling with an oppressive economic system. They still had serfs and resentment among the poor and the peasant class. In 1912, two years before the war broke out, two powerful hostile blocs had been formed in Europe, on the side, one, one on the side um, of France and Great Britain and Russia, whereas on the other side was that increasingly isolated Germany with relatively lukewarm support from Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And Italy, as we know, would drop out eventually, and the Turks, the Turks would enter under the guise of the Ottoman Empire. What were the concerns of the alliance? Well, for a long time, Italy and France competed in establishing a colony in Tunisia. In the end, Italy lost the race and wished to enlist diplomatic support. Italy joined Germany and Austria-Hungary to form the Triple Alliance in 1882. Shortly after, Serbia joined the alliance through a treaty with Austria-Hungary. In 1883, Romania joined the alliance, and thus there was a powerful Central European bloc was created. Romania secretly joined the alliance on the orders of the king um, at the time, who was of Germanic ancestry, coupled with the fact that the king feared Russian expansion and their competing claims on um, Bessarabia. This was the first formal war camp in Europe, the second being the Triple Entente, an informal alliance formed in 1907. The treaty provided that Germany and Austria-Hungary were to assist Italy if it was attacked by France without provocation. In return, Italy would do the same for Germany, yet for Austria and um, Hungary. It promised to remain neutral if Russia attacked. The treaty was renewed in 1887. Italy gained an empty promise of German support of Italian colonial ambitions in North Africa in return for Italy's continued friendship. Now, Bismarck had to pressure Austria-Hungary into accepting the principles of consultation and mutual agreement with Italy on any territorial changes initiated in the Balkans or on the coast in the islands of the Adriatic and the GNC. However, Italy um, and Austria-Hungary couldn't overcome their basic conflict of interest in that region, despite the treaty. 
1891, there were attempts were made to add Britain to the alliance, though it was unsuccessful, and rumors were widely spread about the fact that Britain had joined with Russia. This fear would later on be proven to be correct. After the alliance was renewed in 1902, Italy secretly extended a similar agreement to France. Neither Italy nor Austria-Hungary was permitted to change the status quo in the Balkans without previous consultation. On the 1st of November, Italy and France promised to each other to remain neutral in the event of an attack on the other. There were several war plans that were drawn up prior to World War I beginning. Uh, one was the French plan, number 17, and that placed really heavy emphasis on rapid offensive against um, their, on their uh, western border, on their eastern border. Um, the Schlieffen plan got its name from its creator, Count Alfred von Schlieffen and he served as the chief of the Imperial General Staff. Schlieffen drew up this operation between 1897 and 1905 after an alliance established between Russia and France in 1891 meant that Germany could face a two-front war. That's something that they didn't want to have to do. So the Schlieffen sorry, strategy assumed that Russia, having recently lost the Russo-Japanese War, would take at least six weeks to mobilize its troops and attack Germany from the east. In that time, Germany would stage an attack on France by marching west through neutral territory of Netherlands and Belgium. This route avoided the heavily fortified direct border with France, Plan 17. Um, then, French, then German forces would uh, sweep south, delivering a hammer blow through Flanders, Belgium, and onward into Paris, crushing French forces in less than 45 days. Once France was defeated, according to the plan, Germany could transport its soldiers um, east using its railroad network and deploy them against the Russian troops, which Schlieffen firmly believed would require six weeks to mobilize and attack Germany. This plan did not work out exactly as they wanted. <laughs> 